Well, I guess it's 3.15, we should get started. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for coming. This is Programming Augmented Reality, colon, make your own sci-fi. My name is Frank Kruger. You might know me from an open source library, SQLite-Net, or my other popular library, SQLite-Net. Or you might know me from Pre uh, as Preclarum on Twitter. I try to make jokes, but I usually just put my foot in my mouth. But it's still a fun account to follow, so I highly suggest it. Awesome. So I'm actually really excited to give this talk. Uh, kind of three reasons. I got started programming because of 3D graphics. So this is the first time I've actually gotten to professionally present on that topic. Also because I love data visualization and just graphics in general. Augmented reality combines that. And lastly, I just like messing with people. So this is like the perfect talk for me to give. I want to start a little slowly with a description of what augmented reality is. And that's because it's often getting confused with, say, virtual reality. So if you go to the Darwin Lounge, you'll see the Oculus uh, Rift headset there. You can play around. That's virtual reality. That's when it takes you out of the real world, puts you on a holodeck, and you're doing something altogether different. Augmented reality is different. Augmented reality is let's bring in as much of the real world we can and enhance our senses with computer graphics, with new sounds, with data visualizations. Here's a little example. This is from the movie Iron Man. Uh, this is him flying around. I don't remember what he was doing. But this is the general idea of call it augmented reality 101. We were taking in a large view of the world, overlaying some nice little interesting graphics on it, just trying to enhance your senses. But there are other more interesting uses of augmented reality. Basically, any time you're taking the real world and distorting it, it's augmented reality. And this is a great app. This is WordLens. It came out on the iPhone just years and years ago. It impressed me back then, and it continues to impress me today. All it does, all, <laughs> is takes written text that someone puts up and translates it into a different language in real time as you're moving your phone around. It's one of the greatest apps I've ever seen, and I hope you all try it out. It was so good that Microsoft copied it with a Bing lens or Microsoft Phone Windows lens or something like that. But it does beg the question, why augmented reality? Why even virtual reality? Why all these non-reality realities? I'd like to think of a few reasons. Um, first, it's actually useful. We can present data in a context that people are aware of. We're an old species. We've been on this planet for a long time. We're very well adapted to it. We understand that far things get small. Things to my right are actually to my right. So it's good that our apps actually emulate that. It's very comfortable for a person to see, the, to see data in a way that they're accustomed to. And in the old uh, saying, a picture is worth a 1,000 words, we can present a lot of data graphically that would be difficult or just annoying to present textually with a uh, list view and buttons and all that kind of stuff. But honestly, the best reason is because it's fun. Remember the Terminator? He was fun. He was walking around and targeting people and shooting them. He was fun. It was cool. Also, it extends our senses. Uh, as a species, we're just kind of limited to what we were given. And we can use computers and hardware to enhance that. And then my own little uh, personal reason for getting into all this is I think that games are fun. And I think specifically reality-based games are going to be big in the future. It's fun to sit at home in front of a TV and blow through some virtual world. But it's more fun to play an open social game that actually requires you to leave your house, go out to some parks, and do some interesting things. And lastly, this is kind of a business reason to do it. It's basically mobile only. I don't know of any other platforms where you can do augmented reality very well. We have these really powerful devices. They have cameras. They have really powerful graphics processors in them. They have more sensors than I can even count these days. And they're connected to the internet. This is a perfect platform for this type of technology. But overviews are boring, so let's just jump right into it. Today, we are going to program an augmented reality system. I'm going to walk you through the mathematics behind it, lightly, I promise. I'll try to be as gentle as possible. I'm going to show you the code that you need to interface with hardware. I'm going to show you how to put it all together into a, both a 2D presentation and a 3D presentation. 
And then lastly, I'm going to tell you, don't do any of that and go get a library and start making your own apps with a nice library. But I've broken this presentation up into four sections, and this is really how I think of an augmented reality app. We start with a world simulation or a world database. This is the information that you want to add to your user's uh, perception of the world. It's pretty generic, so I'm going to ho hold on that for a minute. But then there's the real hardware, the real sensors, the guts of writing an augmented reality app. It's the video camera and the location and orientation sensors. So we take all this data, world data, the video camera, location, all these sensors, and then we somehow squish them together into what I'm just calling the augmented view. It's basically your augmented reality app. So again, just to repeat myself, there is a reusable chunk to any augmented, rea augmented reality library, and that's these uh, bottom boxes. Your app is the world simulation. Your app is what data do you want to provide to the world. I highly recommend finding an AR library and using that, though, for these lower boxes. And I'm pretty time constrained, and I have a lot to cover, so we're jumping straight into it. I have to apologize. Every code example I'm going to show is iOS specific. Uh, this is definitely doable on Android and Windows Phone. I just did not take the time to do it. I apologize. So we start with the video camera. I'm sure most everyone here has uh, used it and probably used the high level API for accessing it. So there's just a few things I'll run over. Some of the tricks of it are there are many resolutions that you have to deal with. Uh, we have some nice controls in iOS 8 where we can actually control white balance and exposure, so we actually get a tiny bit of control over the camera. And then there's a property of the camera, which is called the field of view, and that's how much of the world is it letting in. Not only does your video have a width and a height, but it has the real-world perspective of what angle, how much of the world can I actually see through that camera. And the trick here is that we really need high-performance code for dealing with uh, the video feed. The problem is, like, an iPhone camera is an 8-megapixel camera. If we run 30 frames per second, we're all of a sudden processing 240 million pixels per second. Even looping over that data structure takes time. So there's a bit of tricky code to write, but you can also take advantage of the GPU, things like that. So I want to show you the actual uh, soft, uh, <laughs> code needed to access the camera. And this is going to look probably different for all of you because most of us access the camera through the high-level API. We just ask the OS, please, I need an image. Please do your camera UI thing and send me back an image. That's not quite good enough for what I want to do. We want to do real-time programming. So we want to ask the operating system whenever, well, we're going to connect to the camera in the background. So it's not even going to present any user interface. And then as soon as it gets a video frame, we want to be notified. So there's lots of ugly boilerplate code that you have to deal with. Um, it's actually not that bad. It's about 10 or 15 lines of code. But the important things are there are some presets. What resolutions do you want to use? What frame rate do you want to run at? Most games these days run at 60 frames per second. It's everyone's goal to run at, at that speed. At, in this case, I'm just running at 30 frames per second because I never bothered to optimize any of my code, and I can barely do 30 frames per second. So that's some boilerplate code. Eventually, if you just keep going and keep writing all this code, you finally get to this awesome class, AV Capture Video Data Output Sample Buffer Delegate. You have to love iOS for their names, and that's a requirement. You actually do have to love them. There's only one important function on this delegate. And it has three arguments passed to it, and two of them don't matter. The important one is the sample buffer uh, parameter and argument. The sample buffer is just the image. It's the frame that you're actually getting from the camera. The trick here, the reason it's not a UI image or a CG image, is because generally these uh, CM sample buffers exist in video memory, in graphics card memory. And so if you actually want to pull that down to the CPU, you have to ask the operating system to do that. That code's not bad either, but it's pretty ugly. Um, I circled a function where basically that does all the dirty work, so I don't have to show you. I promise, though, I put a demo up on GitHub, so if you're actually interested in seeing how that's done, you can go and grab it. So I want to return to this field of view just for one moment, um, because it turns out it's, it's a very important piece of data, 
And I struggled for a whole day once trying to figure out what is the field of view on the camera. And I would cut out cardboard cutouts, put my camera perfectly positioned, move it to different places, trying to figure out exactly what the field of view is. Well, it turns out that uh, there's just an API for that. And I'm an idiot. <laughs> so I wanted to show everyone there's this device active format uh, video field of view. Nice little thing. I'm going to keep. <laughs> grazing over field of view because I'm going to get back to it soon. So just let that go for a moment. So the video camera is pretty easy there. A little ugly code, but it works. The next sensors that we need to deal with are location and orientation sensors. Location sensor is GPS based, kind of. Uh, it returns our friends latitude and longitude. I hope most everyone's probably familiar with those. Also, sometimes, if you're lucky, it reports altitude. And that usually comes from the GPS. These days, uh, I guess the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus have actual barometers in them. So we probably have more accurate altitude data. But these three values, latitude, longitude, and altitude, specify a position on a sphere. And it turns out the Earth is kind of like a sphere. It's not actually. The equator is a little chubby. And it turns out that the Earth is actually a little egg-shaped. The southern hemisphere is a little chubby, too. But as a first pass, it's a sphere. Also, there are some accuracy issues with GPS. Uh, we've all learned to live with them, but you get a 10-meter accuracy on a lucky day. That is, I could say I'm here, or I could be 10 meters over there, 10 meters over there, 10 meters in front of me. We can thank the US military for that, and we're just stuck with it. It's also not great indoors, which makes doing a presentation in the basement of a very large steel structure very easy and <laughs> relaxing. But you have alternatives if you're doing something indoors. If you've seen all the beacons around for the uh, Evolve Quest, I believe it's called, there's a little uh, hunt that you can do. You can use triangulation from a multitude of sensors to get actually very accurate position data indoors. And so if you want to run a store or a mall or something like that, just put little Bluetooth eye beacons around. Put any, any radio source around that the uh, iPhone can detect and use triangulation. Triangulation is a bit of a mis misnomer. You don't actually want three devices. You need at least three devices. And generally speaking, the more you add, the more accurate it becomes. So we have location somewhat under control. And it's pretty easy to access in iOS. We just create a CL location manager, and we just start listening for an event. There's really not much to it. We can ask for a certain accuracy, and this property is here simply to save power. But since we're a game or we're, we're an interactive thing and we're important, then we should always ask for the best accuracy and forget the battery. Orientation. This guy's a little bit trickier. So orientation. Back in the day, we used to have an accelerometer on the phone. And that was good. We could do a lot of interesting things with the accelerometer. But generally, the accelerometer just measured the direction of gravity. If I was just standing here, it's just telling me what direction is gravity. From that, with a little low-pass filtering, you could actually figure out the orientation of the phone. That was good, but really not at all accurate pretty drifty, pretty laggy, pretty bad in every regard. Because anytime you have a low-pass filter, you have to tune that filter. And that takes time and dedication, neither of which I have. So thankfully, at some point, iOS introduced uh, core motion. And core motion is fantastic because they get around the accuracy issue of the accelerometer for orientation by combining not just one sensor, but three sensors. There is now a magnometer on the phone, and that's just a metal detector, essentially. And if there's no metal around, it finds the North Pole, usually, kind of, sometimes. <laughs> and there's also a gyro on there. And when the gyro's not drifting and giving you bad data, it's actually giving you really nice uh, rotational rates. So if you have an accelerometer, a gyro, and a magnometer, well, now we're talking. Now we can start getting, actually, some good orientation data. So that's great. The problem is most programmers aren't actually familiar with the crazy mathematics behind orientations and rotations. We all like to think of the very first format of it, uh, Euler's angles, pitch, roll, and yaw. These are easy to conceptualize. Oh, if I'm holding the phone and I do this or that, that's a pitch or a roll or something like that. But once you start 
really angling the phone and getting it into some awkward positions, these three values don't combine very well. They're hard to work with. All sorts of things creep up, like gimbal lock, and generally just imprecisions uh, when dealing with angles of this type. So Apple, being the great company that it is, has given us other formats. And one of those formats is something called a quaternion. And I'm actually going to ask for some participation here. Could everyone put their hand up who knows exactly what a quaternion is? Oh, boy. OK, this is going to be fun. So I'm not going to explain it in complete detail, because we're not going to use it in this presentation. But I want to try to give a little analogy, so maybe it makes a tiny bit of sense. So we all know what a number is, hopefully. It's a number. It's also known as a scalar. And if you think about a one-dimensional universe, most of us don't live in it, but it's possible that you do, and you just have a single number, it was found that in physics, this single number wasn't able to represent everything that we wanted to represent. So, And we also found this odd relationship between cosine sine, the trigonometric functions, and the exponential function if we introduce this new kind of number called an imaginary number. And so if we take an imaginary number, it turns out that that actually represents rotations in a two-dimensional world using a one-dimensional number. It's very confusing. But we found that with complex numbers, if we have a scalar plus an imaginary number, then we can do all sorts of fancy transformations, which include rotations and translations. So we're all pretty familiar with complex numbers, I hope. It turns out that it's quite easy through something called geometric algebra to advance that to the third dimension. Let's just skip over the second dimension. So in one dimension, you need two numbers to represent a full physical transformation and orientation quantity. In three dimensions, you need eight numbers to do that. Now, it turns out, also, that four of those numbers we generally ignore. <laughs> they only really come up in quantum mechanics or uh, uh, electromagnetic theory, that kind of stuff. So we throw away four of those numbers, and what we're left with is four numbers called a quaternion. And just think of it simply as a three-dimensional imaginary number, or complex number, actually. It uses an imaginary component. So it's a three-dimensional number with an imaginary part. That's all a quaternion is, and it represents rotations very nicely. So all that said, we're not going to use those. Instead, we're going to use this other, even more terrible representation for an orientation, and that's called a 4 by 4 transformation matrix, or a hom homogeneous transformation matrix. Yeah, I'm going to quiz you later, by the way. So we live in a six degree of freedom world. I can move forward, back, up, down, left, right. That's three, dim that's three degrees of freedom. And I can rotate myself in three degrees of freedom. So there are, are three degrees of freedom in an orientation. But there are 16 numbers in a 4 by 4 matrix. That's to say that 13 of those numbers are redundant and pointless. So this is not a great representation of orientations. But it turns out that computer graphics and very simple linear algebra math works very well with these matrices. They're very easy to code. They're very fast. Uh, GPUs can accelerate them very well. So even though they're not a great representation, they just work very well, and so we're going to use them. The last thing to know about orientations is it's not good enough for me to say that I am rolled 10 degrees. Because you have to ask, you're rolled 10 degrees from what? Well, if I'm facing north and I roll 10 degrees to the east, then I'm kind of northeast-ish. But that requires that I first state my initial orientation. I am facing north. So any time you get orientation from the phone, you have to ask, it's the orientation in reference to something. And I'll get to that. Yeah, here they are, right here. Apple actually provides uh, four different reference frames uh, for that orientation. They are actually commented out in the code. But if you look down just about three or four lines, you'll start to see them. We have x arbitrary, x arbitrary with another one. Those we just throw away. x arbitrary. We don't want arbitrary numbers in our code. Those are there, again, for power savings. It's a lot of math, and it's a bit of tricky hardware to do what we're going to ask to have a perfect reference frame. But they're there just, I don't know, for toy demos or something like that. The interesting one is 
X magnetic, um, X magnetic north. And what that says is that we're going to measure all of our orientations based upon the magnetic pole of the Earth. That sounds fantastic, right? It's pretty much what we want. The only problem is the magnetic pole of the Earth is constantly moving. Not, a lot of people aren't aware of that, but it's quite annoying. Uh, the little guy just won't stay still. And so you have to go to a website like NOAA, and they'll explain to you. Well, they, actually, they just have a chart. They, they don't know how it moves either. It just moves. And so there's a chart you can get, and you can find magnetic north on a map. But no one wants to do that, so Apple built it right into the API. They'll do the magnetic north correction for you, and they'll give you something called true north. This is the north that we all think about. When you see a map with the latitude and longitude lines, specifically the longitude lines, and they're all going up to the uh, peak of the sphere, that's the North Pole. That's what we all think of the North Pole. But really, that's just some invention of humanity. And the magnetic North Pole is the important one, but we can correct for that. So the actual nuts and bolts of getting the orientation is pretty easy, as you can see. We just create a motion manager. We tell it what our reference frame is going to be. We also have to create an NS operation queue. If you're not an iOS programmer, this might seem strange. Think of it as just a thread. The idea here is that the orientation sensor is going to send us a lot of data very quickly. And we really don't want to burden the UI thread with all that data. So we put it onto a different thread. And then last, that last line of functional code there, you can see that we're pulling out. Apple doesn't call it orientation. They call it attitude. It's just another word. We're pulling out the rotation matrix. They actually support the different formats also, pitch, roll, and yo. So that's nice and easy also. So we have a camera. We have a location. We have an orientation. We're ready to create an augmented app. But we have this big, bright question that illuminates this room. How do we actually do this? The first pass, and this is probably the augmented reality app that you're all used to, is the heads-up display. We just take in the uh, video feed of the world, and we just start labeling different objects throughout that world. We, again, this is, uh, you've, you saw that in the Iron Man picture, and Terminator is a perfect example. But my, my other preferred method for augmented reality is to actually introduce 3D virtual objects into the world. So we don't just start labeling things in the world. We start adding to the world. So you could think about treasure troves. You could think about adding new houses to your neighborhood. Or an architect might want to preview a landscape and see what a new building would look like on it. So we can actually start putting 3D objects into our world. The last technique that you can use is actual pixel mashing, where you're going to go in, take that pixel buffer of the world, and just start changing values to accomplish the visualization that you want. This is a very good technique, but again, very hard. Anytime you do image recognition, uh, it's just an algorithmically complex field, but it's also a computationally expensive field. So I'm not going to cover that, but maybe in five or 10 years, we'll have enough power to actually make some more pixel mashing features uh, more readily available. So how are we going to overlay? Because even in the 2D example, the 3D example, what we need is an in-memory representation of the phone's camera. So that is, we need a virtual camera. We need a camera model. And we're going to pick a specific kind of camera model called the pinhole camera model. The pinhole simply assumes that all light at some point focuses to uh, an infinitely small point in space. It's supposed to represent your retina in your eye, even though your retina is actually kind of big and it's a bad representation of that. But pretty much every video game that you've ever played, every uh, CGI, yeah, CGI movie that you have ever seen, they all use the pinhole camera. We just cheat with it sometimes to produce better effects. Things like depth of field and, well, mostly depth of field, uh, can be represented with better camera models. But the pinhole is computationally efficient and super easy to work with. So again, we're going to work with it. The pinhole camera can be modeled using just two matrices. Again, these are the 4x4 four four matrices that I discussed previously. They're bad representations of orientation and uh, translation, but they work well enough. And there's two of them. One is the projection matrix, and this models essentially the lens of the camera. And in it, we just uh, specify the field of view, which, remember, we actually got from hardware, so we can make our virtual camera have the exact same field of view 
as the hardware camera. And it also takes into account the width and the height of that frame. And obviously, we have access to that information. The more complicated part of the pinhole camera is actually orienting it in space. So we said that location provides uh, a spherical coordinate, latitude, longitude, and an altitude. But all graphics renders, at least every one that I've ever seen, doesn't use spherical coordinates. Instead, they use Cartesian coordinates. And it's just a big word for your x-axis, your y-axis, and since we're doing 3D, your z-axis. So somehow, we're going to have to convert from spherical coordinates into Cartesian. And then lastly, we're going to have to take that orientation sensor information and orient our virtual camera to match our real camera. So we're going to walk through all of that. This slide represents why we're going to go through all the effort. And you're going to see, you're going to be in a bit of pain in the next five minutes when I walk through the next bit of code. So I just want to give you a high level reason why. Because if we take the time to figure out a projection and model view matrix, I'm sorry, the second matrix is called the model view matrix. If you take the time to do that, then converting a location back into a two-dimensional point that can be mapped to that video camera feed, it becomes very easy. It becomes just a few multiplications. So we multiply the projection matrix, the model view matrix. That's the pinhole camera. And then we just have to take a location, multiply that by it, and out pops a two-dimensional value. And with a little hand-waving, we have to do something called a perspective divide, but it's easy, and I'll show that to you, too. So now we're going to show some code. And I'm going to go kind of fast and kind of slow through it. Uh, I'll try to go quickly so that maybe we can take questions at the end, but I don't want to go too fast either. Creating the projection matrix is very easy. I use OpenTK. It's a nice uh, portable library originally meant to just uh, map, well, meant to map OpenGL onto um, .NET. But it also comes with a few uh, vector and matrix uh, math routines, which are very convenient to have around. So I use the library just for that. And in it, I can create a matrix, uh, a four-dimensional matrix. The D actually means doubles. I'm using very 64-bit uh, math. And again, I just have to give it the field of view and the aspect ratio, which is just the width over the height. There are two other variables that the pinhole camera needs, and that is how close can an object get to the camera and how far can an object get away from the camera. If we assume that I'm using meters, I'm simply saying that I want, ob I want to see objects up to a centimeter near me, and I want to see them up to 4.7 kilometers away from me. I chose 4.7 kilometers because that's generally the horizon for someone of my height. OK, so the projection matrix is simple. The real trick is this model view matrix. It's the integration of that location and orientation data. So we've already been down that path, and I'm not going to give anything away. That's the path we're going to take through the rest of the presentation. But there is a second approach, and that's using image recognition. Instead of using the GPS sensor, instead of using orientation, we can key on different parts of the world that we know their exact location. And once we do that, using image recognition, we have a much better precision, uh, accuracy, I'm sorry, about our location in the world. This is very difficult to do, but the benefits are it's very accurate and there's no latency. It's great for indoor environments, things that you can control. You're going to have to rely on sensors if you want to be in uncontrolled environments. So determining this matrix is a little bit tricky, so I'm going to break it into four little bits here. First thing, we're going to walk through converting our spherical coordinate into a three-dimensional uh, Cartesian coordinate. Then we're going to have to find the direction of up, which is kind of funny because you know, if you're in the southern hemisphere, up is quite different than if you're living up in Canada or something like that. So we have to find an up vector, and I'll explain why in just a moment. And then we're going to orient ourselves to face the North Pole, just so that we have an absolute reference frame to begin with. And then lastly, we're going to take the orientation of the device and point ourselves, hopefully, in the same direction as the device. So how do you convert a spherical coordinate into, or specifically an Earth coordinate, a geo coordinate, into a three-dimensional uh, Cartesian coordinate? Well, there is a, uh, standard way of, a simple standard way of doing it. We've probably all learned it in high school of how to convert spherical coordinates to Cartesian. Uh, and that model, it's assuming that the Earth is at the coordinate 0, 0, 0. It's called Earth Center, Earth Fixed. And the idea is the Earth doesn't rotate. The universe rotates around it. I prefer this representation. It simplifies everything. 
And honestly, most apps just use that representation. No one actually models a solar system or anything like that. The other option is that we can actually flatten out the Earth in much the same way that Google Maps or any, any two-dimensional mapping program would do. And, that, and we just assign uh, x's to the east, north is uh, y coordinate, and then z is simply up. We don't, I don't use this representation very often because obviously it's physically inaccurate, though it, it, it can be used to pretty well simulate reality, but it's still kind of off. So I'm going to use the spherical coordinate system. And it all boils down to the simple mathematics here. Real easy. <laughs> Again, I'll have this demo so that you can look at it on GitHub. We just do a bunch of cosines and sines. Take my word for it. This is mostly right. This actually assumes that the Earth is a perfect sphere, which, as I said, it definitely is not. But uh, it works very well. And you can, uh, there, there are equations. You can go on Wikipedia to find them that actually take the eccentricity of the planet into account. But honestly, that level of refinement's not usually needed for game type things, the things that I want to create. But if you're doing something that's really important, you want to use the better mathematics for that. Next, we need to find our up vector. Now, if you're not familiar with the word vector, just replace it with the word arrow or direction. We need a direction for knowing which way is up. And to do that, since the Earth is conveniently located at the 0, 0, 0 coordinate, we simply take our position and keep going up. We simply take our position and subtract it from the Earth. We subtract it from 0, 0, 0. That's why there's actually no subtraction. And then we normalize it. And normalization just roughly means we don't take into, its, into account its length, only its orientation. So up. Up is pretty easy. Now we've got to look at the North Pole. So we want to orient ourselves to look at the North Pole. And to do that, I'm going to force my z-axis. I'm going to do a little silly thing here. If I put my arms up, I'm going to call um, my right arm z. I'm going to call my left arm y. And we'll just x. I don't have a third arm. I'm sorry. So we're going to put it so that my right arm is facing the North Pole. That's pretty easy. We just do um, a little bit of subtraction, a little normalization again, because we don't care about lengths. And we know up, because we calculated that previously. Now we're going to use a little vector function called a cross product. A cross product is a simplified multiplication of vectors in three dimensions. It really doesn't mean anything to you, other than the fact that if you have two perpendicular vectors and you cross them, you'll get the third perpendicular vector in three dimensions, obviously. And that's all I'm doing here. I'm determining my right hand, determining up, crossing them, and getting a full orientation. And then I'm encoding that orientation into a matrix. Then there's a slightly harder part. And I've spent just days and days. If you sit down and read the Apple documents, they usually use roughly five words to describe a very complex subject. I don't know why. I think they're all brilliant, and they realize that the rest of us aren't. And I read their documentation, and I really understood it. I've been programming 3D graphics since I've been 14 or 15 years old. And I, I implemented it exactly how they said I should, and it didn't come out at all correct, just completely wrong. And so I futzed with it. I leaned back in my chair. I ran my hands through my hair. And I just kept messing with it. Finally, I figured out their orientation. So whenever you see a 3D programmer start putting negatives in and start listing columns in the wrong order, you see that I'm doing columns 1, 2, and then 0. I'm not doing 0, 1, 2. This is a poor man's rotation. This is a poor man's uh, transfer of reference frames. So this is encoding a weird uh, rotation that I don't understand. And basically, what I'm doing is I know that my right arm faces north. I have no idea what Apple's reference frame is actually doing, even though the docs say what it should be doing. So I'm just correcting for it by using some negatives and listing the columns in the wrong order. Fortunately, once I've accomplished that, it's really easy to uh, convert that back over into our model view matrix. And we succeed. So now we have our projection matrix, our model view. It's very easy to convert a point into two-dimensional. The last step is the one I uh, raise my hands over. So let's say that we have a latitude, a longitude, and an altitude. I want to know the 2D coordinate on the video image that that uh, correlates to. And this is that last final bit of math. This implements the camera model. Uh, looks like line number two there has the camera model. Finally, we use that camera 
camera model to change our 3D Cartesian point into what is called a three-dimensional homogeneous point, which doesn't matter very much, except for the fact that we're allowed to do what's called a Z, Z divide, but in this case, because we're using homogeneous coordinates, it's a W divide, simply this. Farther objects get smaller. So the farther Z is, the farther away from it is from me, the bigger Z will be. And if I divide by Z, the smaller it'll get. This is a very simplistic uh, a view of how the world works, but it's pretty much how all computer graphics work. So it's fine. Lastly, we have to take that uh, Z converted point and scale it to the actual size of the video. No big deal there. That's just the last few lines. So now I want to give an actual demo of this going. And I wonder if you could please switch me to the iPhone. And I wonder if I can put my password in before anyone sees. <laughs> Great. Uh, you all saw that, didn't you? So I wrote a little app here. And this is the source code for it is available on the GitHub. Uh, I'll give you the URL at the end here. But you see, there is the Georgia Institute of Technology. And if we pan around a little, oh, there's the aquarium that we all spent last night at. And I'm going to look for it. The hotel itself, right, 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 right. The hotel itself should be around here. Mm -mm, there it is. OK, so I found the hotel. It turns out it's right over here, so you have to know that. <laughs> I don't know exactly what coordinate I picked for the hotel. But so generally, you could use this as like a tourist activity, uh, find yourself around the city. The code for this is very simple. I've pretty much shown you 90% of the code. I just have a tiny bit more to put these labels on and to rotate them. Oh, that's going to make you sick. Sorry. And it, you can tell it's not even that great because they kind of pop around a tiny bit. <laughs> but this is the basics. So even with what? We probably did 100 lines of code. You can get an augmented reality app up and running. But if we could switch to my computer, please. That's not the best version that I want to show. My real preference is to do things in 3D. So that was the 2D overlays onto reality. I want to also show you the introduction of 3D objects into reality. And to do that, I'm still going to have the reality screen showing in the background. But then I'm going to use an OpenGL renderer on top of it. And the OpenGL, fortunately, at least OpenGL 1, uses the exact same camera model that I just described. It's a pinhole camera with a projection and model view matrices. So quite simply, I need an image view with an OpenGL view that's mostly transparent on top of it. And then I'm just going to put 3D objects into that view. And it turns out that to control the OpenGL camera is very simple. I take these matrices that I already have and just pass them on into OpenGL. The rest, I just have to take any model that I have that's specified in meters or something. So I could have a house model. I could have a building model. And I just throw those triangles and vertices at OpenGL also. And thanks to this camera model, everything will just render nicely. So I took that idea, and I started to make a little game. It's probably going to be the worst game you've ever seen. But I like it, and it sometimes works. If you could switch to my phone again, please. We're going to hope that we get a signal down here. Again, asking for GPS coordinates in a steel structure is not usually good. Fortunately, I have a backup if we don't actually get a good signal. <laughs> Come on, cross your fingers. Aha. So what I've done is instead of showing the aquarium, I put a flying dragon over the aquarium. And I even put a dragon over the hotel. There he is, just kind of hanging out, swooping around. And then I really wanted this to be a game so that I could select a gun, find a dragon, and just start shooting at the dragon. So this is what I'm talking about. This is much more effective if you're outside and you start putting dragons at interesting points, like in a park or something like that. But the idea is, let's just start making video games that actually take advantage of the real world. And I even have a laser with the worst sound effect you've ever heard. This is what, you know how they have programmer art? Well, there's also programmer sounds. And that's about it. 
<laughs> for a dragon. <laughs> There is that one last part of an augment. Oh, sorry. Uh, yep, thanks. The one last block that I mentioned in the initial diagram in the beginning, and that's our world simulation. It's really up to you. This is what your app is all about. The world simulation can just be a bunch of geotagged data. It can be an Azure service of other people's locations. It could be your social network of um, well, it's privacy issues and all that, but people just uploading their locations up to a server. Really, anything that you can geotag uh, has the potential to become a dragon that you can shoot. So just to help you kind of get the juices flowing in the brain for maybe different applications you can do, again, my preference is games. I just want to see a, a plethora of augmented reality games, and we are starting to see them, like one called Egress. Oh, boy, the others are uh, not coming to mind, but they are coming. We're in the early stages. We're in the wild, wild west stages. No one knows exactly what these reality-based games are going to be, but we are, as they said in the keynote, giants standing upon the shoulder of giants. So it's up to us to decide what these games could be like and these interactions could be like. My, my favorite personal idea, well, OK, the dragons, shooting dragons is my favorite idea. But my other one is I want intercontinental worms. So if I have a friend in Paris or something, I want to be able to lob a missile at them and then have them get a notification if I actually hit their target, something like that. Then you can think of other, uh, other genres of apps, non-games, I guess. We have social apps, so you can do friend location. Again, it's basically find my friends, but a little more interesting, a little more walking around a city. You can guide people around cities, so it's great for tourism. And then it really does have industrial applications or commercial applications. I live in Seattle, where it's generally foggy and gray, and boats are generally gray and on gray water with gray clouds above them, so quite often we lose boats in the water. And so augmented reality has actually found a really great home in tracking ships uh, throughout, throughout the sea. We've seen the same thing with flights. You can track an airplane flying overhead. If you see a helicopter flying overhead, point your camera at it. That camera orientation can be correlated with a database that knows about all the active aircraft in the area and can try, try to determine which one it is. And then architecture, again, I mentioned this one where you can have a site plan and see that and see your building projected into it. So all that said, I do want to make the point that writing your own augmented reality engine is actually quite easy. But the devil is always in the details. It's hard to get these things perfectly right. Specifically, orientation loves to drift. It'll be perfectly aligned in the beginning, and then just slowly, 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 you're facing the wrong direction. This is a, just a big problem with sensors. It's, always, it's been a problem with sensors and gyros since the 1950s, so it's nothing new. Uh, but maybe in 50 or 100 years, we'll get these sensors down. But until then, let other people with a lot of math knowledge, a lot of signal processing knowledge, write a library for you. I went to this website, Social Compare. I've never actually used it before, so I don't recommend you go there. But they're pretty great because you can socially compare things. And I looked up augmented reality SDKs, and there's a lot of them. I narrowed it down to just the ones that are mobile compatible, and I still got 45 plus SDKs that you can use. So you have no excuse, even if you don't like the mathematics, if you don't like working with the hardware and writing high, high performance code, no problem. Just go grab one of these. This is my promised link. You can go on to GitHub slash preclarum slash AR demo. You can see all that fancy code. And maybe we can all be walking around later looking like kind of silly people with our phones in front of us. And with that, I want to thank you for coming. And I hope you enjoyed it.